let's talk about the coming disruption of energy. So start with technology cost curves. Solar is the cheapest form of energy generation on the planet, unsubsidized. Solar today is the cheapest source of energy in history. Nothing else is as cheap as solar today, right? You know, this is why we've seen solar capacity grow by thousands of percent in just a decade. And today solar is so cheap that the total costs of solar are lower than just the operating costs of coal, nukes, oil, or gas generation. That's today. So even if you get that gas power plant for free, the costs of running that power plant are higher than all the cost of solar. And that's happening today. What do you think is going to happen to coal, nuke, oil, and gas? They're disrupted, right? They can't compete. For purely economic reasons, solar is already disrupting everything else. Now, solar improved by 82% in costs in the 2010s. Is that shocking? Because, you know, some folks said that that was unpredictable. Bill Gates <laughs> said that that was unpredictable. In fact, well, I did predict it. In 2010, I wrote an article, uh, an op-ed in the San Francisco Chronicle that said exactly that, that I expected solar costs to drop 80 to 90% over the next decade. And unsubsidized solar would be cheaper than anything else, right? So the cost curves, again, are like gravity. These things can be predicted, right? I don't care what anybody's uh, opinion of gravity is. That is settled science, okay? And today in America, 90% of the generation projects that are waiting to be interconnected to the network, to the grid, 90% are solar or wind. And 98% of storage is batteries. Solar, wind, and batteries are eating everything. Despite the fact that utilities don't like solar, right? 90% of projects waiting for an interconnection are solar or wind. And solar is so cheap now, a cent per kilowatt hour, two cents per kilowatt hour, that steel producers are moving where the solar is, right? So cheap, abundant energy changes everything. Essentially, companies are moving to where cheap energy is, right? Um, but it's not only industrial, right, or utility scale. Um, on basically rooftops, the thing that will change everything, assuming, of course, that we have a competitive market, that we don't have monopolies, utilities pushing back uh, like they are on rooftop solar and batteries. So what I call God parity, generation on demand, is when the cost of rooftop solar, whether it's residential or commercial, falls, and, and batteries, fall below the cost of transmission, right? When the cost of you generating your own energy falls below the cost of transmission, meaning that even if utility scale generation is zero, when you add the transmission and the CEO costs, um, essentially, it's still gonna be higher than self-generation, and we're there. We're already there, right? That's called God parity. We're pretty much there around the world, thousands of cities are potentially below God parity. And solar is so cheap that there's a company in Australia building um, uh, houses with solar panels. Solar panels are so cheap that you can use them instead of structural plywood. Even if you don't generate energy, solar PV is cheaper than plywood. That's happening today. So you get all that energy for free, right? It's a gift. It's essentially buy the house, get free energy, or buy the energy, get a free house. Any way you look at it, things have changed dramatically, and solar is going to continue coming down in costs. We expect another 
70% plus over the next 10 years. And wind is going to drop. It dropped by 46. It's going to drop another 43 over the next decade. Battery costs, which went down you know, by almost 90%, we expect another 80 plus percent over the next 10 years. A drop in costs, right? That convergence of solar, wind, and battery is already happening. Solar and wind are the cheapest sources of energy, period. And we expect that combination of solar, wind, and battery to be 70% cheaper by 2030, right? So the cheapest sources of energy are becoming 70% cheaper. What do you think is going to happen? This is going to change everything. There is no reason to use anything else, right? Disruption is inevitable, right? Now, one of the things that the mainstream has pushed back on, and many experts have pushed back on, is the idea that you cannot have 100% solar, wind, and batteries, right? It's a moving target, by the way. First, they said you can't have more than 5% penetration, then 15%, then 30%, then 50%. I mean, that story uh, keeps changing, right? But now they say you cannot have 100%, right? So we did the numbers for the whole system, right? Um, we took real world um, hourly wind and solar demand generation data. Uh, we took real world hourly uh, demand data across the US. Uh, we simulated the battery to see if it was possible for a system to be 100% solar, wind, and battery. And we started with New England as a system, and Texas as a system, and California as a system. Um, and we ran the numbers. And the answer is yes, you can have um, energy systems that are totally 100% solar, wind, and batteries. Not only can you have that system, that system is the cheapest possible energy generation system on the planet, period. Nothing else comes close to that, right? But here's the other things that we found. There is a non-linear trade-off between generation and storage. So this is not just a one-to-one -one substitution of, you know, you take out a coal plant and you put in solar wind and battery and, and so on, right? If you overbuild, quote unquote, solar, you need fewer batteries. And if you underbuild, then you, you need more batteries. So there is a nonlinear, it's a U-curve. We call that the clean energy U-curve. And in fact, the least cost system would have anywhere from three to five times more capacity to generate, depending on geography, than the existing, the conventional energy system. Three to five times, right? And nowhere on the planet have we found a place that needed more than a few days of storage. So anyone who sells the idea of seasonal storage, that we need months and months and months of storage from the summer to the winter or vice versa, is not looking at the evidence, right? We haven't found a single place that needs more than a few days of battery storage, right? In America, it's somewhere between 35 and 90 hours, basically under four days of battery storage. So yes, it's possible. Yes, it's the cheapest possible energy system. And it will create so much energy, free energy, right? So these are the numbers to build a 100% solar, wind, and battery system by 2030 if we had started when we published the report a couple of years ago. And this is a phase change disruption. The 100% solar wind and battery system is not the old system, right? The old system is a caterpillar. The new system is a butterfly. You can't just add wings to the old system and pretend that it's a new system. It's not. It has different properties, different metrics, different dimensions. And one of the most important ones is what we call superpower. In energy, solar wind and battery 
superpower. Meaning, because we have so much more capacity to generate the demand that we already have, we're going to generate vast amounts of energy in addition to meeting existing demand. And that's super abundant, zero marginal cost energy. How so? In California, we can generate nearly twice the electricity that we generate today for free. And this is superpower, 93% of days. And even in New England, 64% of days, they can generate uh, almost twice as much energy as they generate today, right? Anywhere in the world, we've looked, um, we have found massive, some more than others, of course, depending on geography and demand, superpower. And superabundant clean energy changes everything, right? And it's not just disruptive to electric power, it's disruptive to all forms of energy. So if you think about Texas, for instance, the existing demand in blue and orange is superpower, meaning that's the um, superabundant excess clean energy generation that is essentially zero cost. If you invest in the least cost system, essentially Texas could generate, could meet all of its transportation needs using this superpower. If Texas chooses to build a slightly bigger system, so invest 20% more money, it could need all its transportation, residential, and commercial usage, and a lot of the industrial energy usage. It's disruptive to everything. You could essentially space heat, industrial heat. It can all be met with solar, wind, and batteries. And superpower, like I said, is free, right? But it's not a one-to-one -one substitution. In Texas, for instance, solar capacity would be nine times higher than wind capacity, right? So the solar opportunity is a lot larger than the mainstream one-to-one -one substitution implies. Nine times more solar. And in fact, Texas would need just 49 hours of storage to combine with solar and wind to meet all its existing demand, right? Two full days of storage. Think about it. The outages that we had um, in Texas recently would not have happened if they had a solar, wind, and battery infrastructure. They would have had two full days of storage, no matter what, even if you know there's no sunshine and there's no wind. And this, of course, doesn't include distributed storage uh, in electric vehicles and so on. What about Alaska? Can you do that in Alaska, solar, wind, and batteries? Yep, you can. So I was recently there uh, with my Rethink X team. We studied uh, three regions in Alaska, Anchorage and the rail belt, uh, the largest one, Juneau, the capital, and Kotzebue, which is north of the Arctic Circle. In all of these regions, you can meet 100% of the demand with solar, wind, and batteries. Now, uh, Alaska has um, a lot of uh, hydro that is already installed. So um, essentially, if you keep the existing hydro, you don't have to tear it down. You don't need to build new hydro. You can meet 100% of the uh, electric power and energy demand in, in Alaska with just solar, wind and batteries, even 30 miles north of the Arctic Circle, period. What about Germany? Northern country, economic power, can they do 100% solar, wind and battery? Yes, they can. And Germany can meet all its electricity needs with solar and wind and batteries and about 110 hours of battery storage. That's all they need. So there's no need for seasonal storage, but they need uh, a lot of solar, right? In fact, they need more solar than wind to meet all those needs. And they can meet all their electricity needs. And if they invest in a system that is 20% more investment than the least cost system, essentially Germany could generate 
more than twice their existing electricity demand in superpower. So they can generate twice their existing demand for electricity. Um, and you know the 600 terawatt hours are essentially superpower, free, right? What can Germany do with a power uh, infrastructure that generates twice for a lot less money than um, basically today and they can be self-sufficient. They don't need to import anything, right? Gas or whatever. Um, they don't need to be held hostage uh, for their energy needs. India. India has amazing geography for solar, wind, and battery. India's electricity cost can be one cent per kilowatt hour. And all they would need is about a day of battery storage. India can be an energy superpower. And imagine what that superabundant energy at one cent or even free for the superpower can do for the economy. Uh, and it can generate almost twice the, 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 the energy almost every single day of the year. Amazing. And the economics of SWB are disruptive, right? Because it's a U-curve and not a straight line, essentially what you get is that a 20% additional incremental investment can return two to 300% more energy. Think about it. What investment essentially um, can you make that if you make a 20% incremental investment, it's going to return 200% plus more superpower. No form of extraction resource energy can compete with this. None, period. Now, some would say, why waste that overcapacity, 4x? Why have, you know, four times solar or whatever? Well, again, the incumbents, an incumbent uh, mindset, don't see the opportunity space. Typical, right? So think about Amazon a decade ago. They created this vast information technology infrastructure, but they essentially used it five weeks of the year, the holiday shopping season. Essentially, they overbuilt their information technology capacity for the rest of the year. Let's call it super data center, right? So essentially, um, the creation myth goes, they said, why don't we rent out that uh, excess capacity to others, to the market. And they did. And thus, Amazon Web Services was born. A trillion dollar business was born because of that. So what are the business model innovations that are going to open up because of superpower, right? The incumbents won't see it. They see superpower as a liability. Of course they do, right? But the entrepreneurs, what are the business model innovations? What are the new products and services that can be built, like Amazon built Amazon Web Services? So New England superpower, 20% additional investment, 200% additional superpower. This is New England, right? And this changes economic development. So for Texas, 100% solar, wind, and battery, with 20% upsizing, which would cost just about $42 billion, with that incremental superpower, right? So that system could meet all the demand, today's electricity demand, and that superpower could power every data center in the world, every Bitcoin miner in the world, and they would still have 106 terawatt hours for industrial purposes or any other purposes. All that is superpower, that's free energy, right? That's how superpower changes everything. It changes water desalination, it changes uh, waste, it changes manufacturing. It has geopolitical consequences. Superpower, solar, wind, and battery superpower changes everything.